so we 365 key chapters of the Bible up to uh, old, alternating Old and New Testament. We last time we're in 2 Samuel 7, uh, 5 and 7, and we saw there the Davidic covenant, but now something dramatic takes place in chapter 11 that is uh, a radical and uh, a transforming uh, ex experience here in David's uh, life, as we're about to see. Uh, before we get to that, though, I just wanted to, again, give you a little bit of a background setting of David's story. 1 Samuel uh, 16 to uh, 1 Kings 2, a key, key uh, Bible figure, major events of David's life, uh, Hebron. So he, first of all, southern kingdom for seven years, and then the, the, rem the remaining of Israel. And uh, they, they then, at the, in the year 1004, 971, he reigned uh, the entire uh, kingdom. And so in his life, he was the king elect. He became the king and throne. This is just a reminder again, Judah and Israel, 33 years. And so he was a figure, a key figure um, as, as substantive in the Old Testament as uh, the, the life of Abraham. I'm not going to go into detail with uh, David's uh, life here, but uh, just to, to summarize. Well, I will do, I'll show you one thing here. I want to show you this because you see here we have David's triumphs and it brings us up to chapter 10. And what's significant is victory produces vulnerability in a man's life. You need to bear that in mind. Whenever things are going well, you, they converge, you're vulnerable. It's my hand, my strength, the might of my hand that made me this wealth or this, brought me this beware that that's, that's, that happens. And so he had these military triumphs, as we'll see, and then suddenly, wham, chapter 11, this pivotal point in the chapter, and this, uh, and I'll, I, I'll explain why I think there are reasons why I think he was vulnerable to it in other ways as well. And then the consequences, the rest of the book describes the consequences of his sin would not, uh, di would not disappear. So the consequence, then we success and then sin and then failure is what you see here in this overview. Or you could say obedience, disobedience, and judgment. Because in spite of the fact that God forgives, there, there's no guarantee that he will eradicate the consequences of disobedience. There are times, there are times when in his grace, he actually mitigates even those consequences, but don't count on it. And so in David's uh, life, he, he by, at the end of his life, was called a man after God's own heart. But at the same time, this haunted him, plagued him, destroyed his family and the integrity of his, of his household for the rest of his life. And it had an ongoing effect in Israel as well. You cannot sin in a vacuum, you see. And when you, th so a sinful thought life will eventually lead to a sinful act, you see. So a thought, reap an, reap an action. So an action, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a character. So a character, reap a destiny. It comes down to the little things. Everything matters. There's no little people, no little places, no little events, but no little thoughts either. So chewing to, on what, asking yourself, what are you chewing on? He was allowing himself to meditate on those things which were unworthy of him. Um, so he's in Hebron, again, he's in Jerusalem. So this just gives you a per perspective of the, of the book itself. And the theme and the purpose then, uh, there was no break bef between 1 Samuel 31, the last verse, and 2 Samuel, the last verse of that. Remember, this in the Hebrew Bible was one, uh, one book. And uh, so it was with Kings and Chronicles. Um, but there's a divine perspective on David's, uh, Saul's and David's rules. But there was tremendous uh, tr tribal hostility and there was a split in the, uh, in the kingdom then in 931 BC. So what I find that's fascinating about this book is it's a candid portrait. It, it shows his strengths, but also reveals his weaknesses. He's not simply, simply glorified, but there is, as I say, a balanced presentation where there's a brutal honesty in the nature of his life. And so we see this, God's perspective. And obedience then fundamentally, chapter 1 to 7, brings blessing, chapters 8 to 10. But we could say disobedience, chapter 11, then brings judgment, the rest of the book. And another, so that, these are spiritual truths. Sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. And James gives a description of sin, the anatomy of sin, where it starts in your mind as a possibility. 
and you begin to concretize it into action. When you chew on it, it's a possibility. And when you think of, a, of, of, an, of an act that's wrong and consider it as an option for, for a pursuit, it then becomes more and more real. And after a while, it'll have a compelling power over you. And then you become dom dominated by it. And then it brings forth death. So these are, these are just key themes uh, for the book itself. So remember in David's life, there was the Davidic covenant. There was the covenant that the Abrahamic covenant, remember, consisted of three components. The Abrahamic covenant was an unconditional covenant and it involved the three dimensions of land, seed, and blessing. And so the land component, which is uh, falsely, wrongly called the Palestinian covenant, because I've told you before, never call it Palestine. It, was never, it never existed. Um, that's a Roman pejorative term in the second century to, to, to put them back to the Philistines. That's where it came from, Philistine, Palestine. But instead, it's a land covenant. It was Canaan or, it was, or Israel. Um, the, so that the Mosaic law was temporary, but the Palestinian, uh, the, rather the land, the Davidic, and the new. All those were unconditional and ultimately fulfilled um, in God's purposes. So this was a pivotal moment in David's life then, these, these covenants, where you see that there is a unification of the kingdom of Judah. And so Judah and um, um, Israel would all be united together in a consistent way. And so going back to that, just another thought here. Um, I wanted to show you this, this. So you have the united monarchy then. So you had basically Syria and so forth, Philistia. So Israel, is Jerusalem in the time of David then, you see, uh, was vastly expanded by the time of his son Solomon. And there we, we're going to see the building of the temple. And this is a, a theme that you see in the material uh, in our text before us. And so I want us to explore that as we as we move forward then. The, um, so going into the text, at the end of chapter six, uh, seven, <coughs> seven rather, when David wants to build God a, a, a temple, a house for God, he says, I'm living in a house of cedar and you're still in this, under this tent, as it were. And God said, Did I, is there any time, time that I asked you to build me a house? But I, 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 I welcome your desire and it is good, but you are a man of bloodshed. It will not be you who builds my, my temple. It'll be your son. It'll be Solomon. He didn't name him then, but that's, it would be your heir. And so I will build you a house instead. So the, he, God turns it around and actually commits to David. And this chapter is the Davidic covenant. I will build you a house, he tells David. And David now is um, full of praise and, and wonder. Now, O Lord God, you are God, your words are truth, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. This is good. This is the beginning. This is the covenant. This is the blessing. And then it's followed that blessing by multiple triumphs, defeating the Philistines, and then defeating uh, the, the Moabites, uh, defeating um, Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah. And he, he captures, and it just gives details of one after another. Uh, that, that the, the Arameans uh, finally give tribute to him. And then um, more and more, Hamath as well. So, so all of these things um, take place. But there's an odd story here, though, when David, uh, Toy, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated all the armor. He, he sent Jerome, his son, to King David to greet him and bless him. Um, and uh, he had been at war. And he brought him articles of silver and gold, and he dedicated these things to the Lord. And this is uh, what's interesting here is that David began to collect all the articles that would be built and used in the temple, although he was not going to be the one allowed to do it. He was so motivated by this that he began to mass and collect all these things that he'd achieved through his conquest and ma massive amounts of, of resources that he supplied during his life so that Solomon, his son, would be able uh, to, to use those. And so all of these things give him tribute, you see. And so David reigned over all Israel, and David administered justice and righteousness for all his people. And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was over the army, and Jehoshaphat, the son of uh, Eliad, the recorder, and so forth. But it would, describes then his, even his kindness, a, a wonderful sweet detail of his kindness to um, one of the sons the remaining from, from Saul. Instead of uh, an ordinary man might want to just eliminate the entire household 
of the one who sought his life so vehemently. But instead, he says, is there yet anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Because he remembers Jonathan as well in that relationship. And so there's a sweet story, as it were, in which he calls this man who um, um, is, is crippled in both feet. And he then actually elevates this man and he gives him, his name is Mephibosheth, and he says, don't fear, I'm going to surely show kindness for you for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land your grandfa of your grandfather, Saul. And you'll eat at my table regularly. And so he prostrated himself. What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? But the, the, all that belonged to Saul, he says, I've given to your master's grandson. So this is a lovely word then. And so it says, Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate at the king's table regularly. And then it says, now he was lame in both feet. It's just to underscore the radical change that took place. So David was a man, really, of great compassion, intelligence, courage, capacity, wisdom. Uh, he was a prudent man, and he was a righteous and equitable man as well. Um, and then it happened that, um, that the king of the Ammonites, when the, the king of the Ammonites died, Hanan, his son, became king in his place. Now here's another example of David. He says, I will show kindness to Hanan, the son of Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me. So he sent some of his servants, but the servants, uh, but the king foolishly listened to some bad advice. He's actually sending spies to overthrow you, to spy out you out. So he sent the servants back and they, they shaved off half their beards and cut off their garments as in the middle as far as their hips. That's really weird. You see, but even here, David understood that they had been degraded in such a way. He sent to meet them, and for the men were greatly humiliated. And the king said, stay at Jericho until your beards grow and then return. Again, a wise thing. Why should they suffer public humiliation? Weird thing to have that, or have that occur. But the point is, um, then the Ammonites became odious to David, and so David defeats them. And then one and after another, the Arameans, and, and the Arameans are defeated. So all of this is, is strong. And all the kings saw they were defeated by Israel. They made peace with Israel and served them. So the Arameans feared to help the uh, sons of Ammon anymore. Everybody was now giving tribute to Israel. David's kingdom was powerful. It was well established. It was secure, and he was uh, had become a very wealthy and successful man in this respect. That's part of the problem. And then it happened in the spring, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem. Why? Why did you, I want to talk with you a little bit about that idea because there's a time in a man's life when he is, in, is terribly vulnerable. You see, in our younger years, our basic um, weakness might be a foolishness, lack of focus in our younger years. In our middle years, I think our biggest challenge would be double-mindedness and entanglement in the world, playing by two systems. And many Christians, many followers of Jesus, even now look to Jesus for their salvation, and then they look to the world for everything else, for their security, for their significance, for their satisfaction, a dangerous thing. And they can, we can slip into it because the heart is deceitful and we can eventually believe small lives which lead to larger ones. And so David is in a kind of a midlife crisis. Now in our older years, by the way, I mentioned about the three times of life, uh, foolishness, naivete in one hand, double-mindedness and entanglement when we're middle in our... What's our problem when we're older, in our later years? What's, what's the big challenge there? Could be bitterness. A lot of people, because of the wrong thinking and then the consequences. But I think it is unteachability. I think they stop learning. They basically uh, decide, okay, I'm now taken care of. I'm going to just take care of myself and just uh, give myself uh, liberties and just, uh, uh, I'm not going to think anymore. When you stop thinking, you start dying, you see, because what happens is this awful disease, what I call the hardening of the categories, you see, which is worse than the hardening of the arteries. You see, your categories are stuck and rigid, and after a while, all you do is watch TV and give opinions. <laughs> You see, you're not thinking anymore. You're not reading well. You're not uh, chewing on, on anything that's tr whatever is true, right, honorable, pure, lovely, 
of good repute, excellence, worthy of praise. You just actually, you're so focused on the news that you don't, you're looking at those, the precise opposite of Philippians 4.8. You lose your intentionality, you, use your, you lose your desire, and you begin to diminish, and, such, and then the consequences take place. Um, I'll, I, I, say, I think I might say a word about that right now because it relates to this. Because without a, se- a clear sense of purpose and calling, and this is the fifth mark of those who finish well. So as you know, in my book, Conform to His Image, the concluding chapter is continuing on the journey, what it takes to finish well. And in my own experience, I studied um, characters in scripture, men and women in scripture, and men and women in the history of the church. And I noticed these consistent qualities of those who finished the race with excellence, whereas most drop out and they become benched. They put themselves on the sideline and they stop moving in the cutting edge of trust and obedience, but rather they just hold things back. And so without a sense of purpose and calling, there'll be a dangerous uh, uh, situation for us. And um, again, purpose and calling is re- really relates, relates to the question, uh, why am I here? Which again, if I'm not asking that question, am I here just to amass wealth? Am I here to raise children and grandchildren? That's a part of it. Yes, there's, you're, gonna have, you're here to have relationships, to build in quality relationships, but you're really here in the larger sense as a spiritual being who is temporarily housed in this earth suit. And I mean short time few decades max. And most men, as I've said before, their problems are mathematical. They, they evaluate uh, uh, time uh, on earth. They look at their time on this earth as, as if it's going to be eternal, eternity. And they treat eternity as if it's something we can deal with just before we die, which is a terrible thing. Um, the idea then is to realize, no, you are here for the briefest of seasons and unless you realize that you will succumb to inferior callings if you don't ask these questions what do our life want my life to add up to and why um, we we could very well miss out but i believe he's called us to a purposeful risk-filled journey and there's the thing when we stop taking risks when we just start just uh, sitting back we lose the cutting edge then of vitality and growth and that's a danger because you and I are called to something that's beyond your occupation. Your voca- you may retire from a career, but you never retire from your vo- vocation. Your vocation really meaning your calling, vocari. And a calling then is uh, on your life. But many men don't even don't live into their calling or they're, not, they're more concerned with the siren voices of the world that tells them what they should in fact pursue. But as a consequence, then, they don't have that, some, that sense of purpose that goes beyond the level of tasks and accomplishments. Um, if they do this, though, they will have, move in that direction. So my view is that the, there's a risk-filled journey in which we're called to trust God for what he wants us to become. I see myself, as I'm getting older, naturally, I real, recognize it's painfully obvious that the number of years are very few indeed. But really, this is true for all of you. I don't care whether you're, you're 20 years old. Your years are few, and and when you're, and as I've told, told you before, every man, every old man has a young man inside of him who asks, "What's happened?" You see, because this isn't the way it's meant to be. You know, you were meant to live longer, but not in this world. You are preparing for the next. You is this is a soul forming world. You're being shaped and prepared in this world, so that that's what it's about. And therefore, you must transfer your hope to that which is going to endure or won't be enough. And after a while, then you'd lose your vitality, the cutting edge of vitality and calling. And this leads to this other issue, uh, with, or Kierkegaard, who said to, that we must define life backwards and live it forward. And that is a very true statement then. Let live with the end in view. And what is the telos that you're going to? Uh, is it just uh, a happy retirement? That's not enough of a worth. That's not a way of living. You're just basically trying to, to kind of bench. You're watching the game from the, from, the bench, from the bleachers, and you're not really involved. No, you are called to continue the journey and to stay in the trust and faith and risk and hope. And so this is the, this is the issue that we have to deal with here. There could be an occasion for despair, 
right here. And this is where David was. Your aspirations will always exceed your accomplishments. You know that. I don't, this isn't, this isn't, I don't have to teach you this. This isn't a faith proposition. Furthermore, your capacity will always exceed your contribution. You reach a certain point, usually uh, uh, between 38 and 45 is the usual window. When you become aware that there's an X curve going on, your, 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 your capacity is diminishing, yet your responsibilities are going up. And that's a painful world, you see. And, and you also become aware of your mortality in a more realistic sense. You knew theoretically that you're going to die, but now it becomes more palpable, more evident that life is short and, and it can lead to a really weird thing. In midlife crisis, a lot of men do the stupidest things they'll ever do. You see, supposing that a new, a new vehicle, a new woman, a new career, a new house, whatever it is, will satisfy them. So they do dumb things. And they discover that those dumb things really don't satisfy because they were meant for something more than some little fix it in this world. It's got to be something bigger than that, more substant. And that's the, I think that this is a reminder, we're not yet home, you see. This is not our true home. And so to see that happening then is uh, an understanding that your life then is dependent on the grace of God and you must continue to move into it. If you do not, then you will become subject to the kind of things that led David then with a sense of a, of a lost sense of purpose, of accomplishment and so forth. So he rose from his bed and walked around on the roof. So he put himself in a vulnerable, vulnerable position. Instead of going out, yes, he wasn't as the, a man of might as he had formerly been, but still he was supposed to go out and lead his armies. And that's what he, the whole idea. But instead with this kind of a process that he's going through there, he became vulnerable. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. And so he said, tell me about my, I need to learn more about my neighbors. <laughs> you know, what, what's, who lives over there and who lives right over there? You know, so this becomes a, 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 an occasion for him. And so he sent messages and took her. Don't know how um, long the process took. It's very possible that it was night after night or something. It's not necessarily that the first day. And this is what happens then. Uh, there's a process of th that where we go into this. And it's a scale, isn't it? And in this scale, um, you have a, this a whole idea of a kind of a neutrality here. Um, and if I put it this way, you, you are, the, the neutral zone is here. But when a person, you read about a person, maybe a, a, a famous minister, and he wakes up and he finds himself at a minus eight. Oh, the press love to pr promote these kinds of things. When a famous individual, a, a Christian leader uh, falls, succumbs to moral temptation, sexual temptation, financial uh, temptation. And as a consequence, he himself wakes up the next morning, after the day after he was caught. He got away for a long time because he was clever. But then, and, and he, he wasn't accountable either because he had a bunch of, of yes men for his board. So uh, there's no accountability, the illusion of it. So the consequence is, how did he become this way? How do you become a minus eight, let's say? You know the answer. The only way you can do it is to become a minus seven. You cannot become a minus, you cannot go from a minus three to a minus eight. Too much cognitive dissonance. You couldn't live with yourself. You couldn't do it. So therefore, it is how, on the other hand, possible for you to go from a minus seven to a minus eight, and so it works in this what manner. So a small, every small compromise makes the next one possible. And so we deceive ourselves by the smallness of our surrenders. Again, the, the sluggard, the, semi, the tragic comic figure, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands to rest. He didn't say a lot of sleep, slumber, and rest. Just a little, a little, a little. And thus we deceive ourselves, as one writer put it, by the smallness of our surrenders. So this is what happens then. After a period of time, it becomes a stronghold in your life. And by the way, the, vir the, the virtuous cycle also is the same. Uh, because you don't become a plus six, let's say, without having become a plus five. So it's a virtuous growth, very gradual, incremental. And it's a, it's a vicious di dimin di diminishment. 
gradual and, and dimension, uh, in this dimension. In my view, there are times when you allow a thing to get a beach hold in your life, as I would call it, and that beach hold can then become a stronghold. It, the longer you cultivate it, the more power it has over you because you're giving yourself over then to forces, can be demonic as well, and they're legalists. And if, as long as they have territory, as long as they have a right, as long as you haven't repented, they, have a, they feel that they have, a, they have a right to harass. And then even to, then some can go so far that it becomes a stronghold. Their addictive behaviors are so great they can't even begin to think of how they could get out of this mess. And so it is with this. I think it was a, a gradual process that the, that the scriptures um, suggest that eventually led to this process. Ooh, okay, I've got it all. I've accomplished it. What's next? What can I do? So the success syndrome is also part of the problem because you see he, he disconnected his um, accomplishments from his vitality when his relationship with God. And that is a great danger. So whether you do well or poorly, unless you are connecting yourself with God and finding that your source, you'll find that the world will never, in its plaudits and powers and possessions and positions and prestige and, and uh, privileges, it'll never provide enough because you are meant for more than the world can sustain. Uh, you, as Augustine put it, are, you have made us for yourself, O oh Lord. Our hearts are restless till they find the rest in you. Again, you are a spiritual being, and therefore no earthbound joy is, a big, is big enough for you by itself. Without God in it, no. You, anything that you set your heart upon that's not eternal, but I mean set your heart upon, this is what you long for more than anything else. If it's, if it's not trans-temporal and trans-finite, it's unworthy of you. It'll be, a, it'll be an idol. It'll be a part of the created order. You were never meant to serve the created order. And so many people succumb to it. What's ironic about this is that those, those, that small company of people who, quote, succeed at becoming rich or famous, what do you discover about them? The ones who really become truly rich and famous say pretty consistently, it's not all it's cracked up to be. But then the person who's quite trying to climb up the, the ladder of success doesn't believe him. I don't believe you. I'm going to keep on going up there. Maybe I, I'll, I'll prove it otherwise. And so most people go to their graves supposing that if they'd only attained that, then they would have been happy. And they, they believed a lie to the very last breath. It's a horrible thought, isn't it? And they failed to grasp who they are, the dignity of their position. And, and so as a result, they lost sight of who they were. And so an identity crisis takes place as part of that midlife crisis. I believe, by the way, the midlife process we just described, the discrepancy between ability and uh, accomplishment, between capacity and, and contribution, I think that's a God-given process to remind us you're not home. You, you long for more then you'll know you'll ever pro attain in this world. If you're thinking clearly, you'll realize that only what God's providing, only He can provide what you're truly looking for. And so we fail to grasp that. And we, because as you know, the power of temptation is that only, it, one of its deceits is that it only reveals its pleasures. <clears throat> temptation never reveals its consequences. That's why men never fantasize about getting caught. You see, it's a, it's a reality. But you would do well to realize that the pain of the consequences are far greater than the pain of the temptation. And so you have to recognize that the more serious you are about walking with Jesus, the greater the temptations will become, actually, because you become someone who's noticed and become a problem. So, and if he can't get you through one thing, he'll get you through another. Often he'll come, come at you through your family. Uh, Duncan? Jim, do you think there's a, a subliminal pressure to get caught since most people who said to get caught? There is a strange, he's asking if there's a subliminal pressure to get caught. And there's a kind of a strange thing where we're playing two different ro uh, roles in, in a sense. Because you see, the more, by the way, the more you succumb to this dishonor, and many people stop at a certain point because they don't want their, their, their public sin profile to be too great. 
So they want to keep a, pro pro a pro profile so low enough so as not to cause an embarrassment. Um, but essentially, though, um, men can deceive themselves and continue to believe that this, if I only have this and so forth. Um, so it's a painful process to watch, though. There's a great um, diminishment of capacity. So I have to ask myself, what is it that I really seek? What am I looking for? Be because those who say, I've, I've attained it. And, the, and when you get, even if you attain it, you'll know it's not enough. So I think there is this process where um, part of us in, in our inside self knows it's true, but we still can't, can't live that way. You're, you become, you live two, lot, two people. The more you become, f the further down this scale you get, I, I'm, I'm going to suggest this as well, the, fur we're, 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 the further down the scale you get, the more schizophrenic you become. We are all imposters to some degree, you see. Um, so the idea of a schizoid is, is the, the notion then of um, an incompass, a, a really a kind of a, um, used to, they used to call it multiple personality disorder. And that's no longer in vogue to call it that. Instead, they call it um, a, a associative identity disorder, which translated means literally the same thing. Yeah. Dissociative identities, multiple personalities. It's, it's, so the, what you're dealing with as a person can be an imposter to some degree, to the degree to which your character is not consistent with your claims, you see, with your calling. So what, that's why we want to ask the spirit to guide us and to, and to be, have short accounts, as they used to call it, to have short accounts so that you do not allow a beach hold to get in there, which could then become a stronghold and then a stranglehold. The point is that you want to be a person who um, has boundaries and doesn't let it go that far. But it can go so far that a man can have two kinds of personalities after a while, where you become less connected with one and the other, you see, and your true self, and you come to a Bible study, but yet there's stuff that you, that you might tolerate on the side that's unworthy of you. So again, we have to ask that, that question and ask the Spirit of God to guide us and instruct us. But um, the question's going to be then, I've seen some people go so far that they be, there are two identities that are not even in touch with each other. And um, one minister in Texas fit this category. I may have told you about this person before, uh, who in the 70s was the pastor of, a, of a, a Grace Fellowship Church, a fellowship revival church, rather, in, in Texas, around the Dallas area. And he was a family counselor as well. But they discovered that, they, that after a while, to the horror, they realized this guy fit the M.O. of a guy who been, they'd been looking for for six years or so, who, was, who would basically uh, rape young women at knife point in White Rock Lake. It was the same guy. How was this possible? Cognitive distance, he couldn't live with himself. So it was a schizoid split. The degree to which you are inconsistent in your beliefs and your behavior, your attitude and action, is the, the beginning of a split. Most people stop it sooner than, the, than this guy. What a horror to discover that this guy, that was the same man. So these things can happen. So going back to David, though, it was a split, as it were. He allowed a false self, a false identity, to begin to dominate him, and he no longer thought about God and the fact that it's God who gave him all this wealth, this power, this victory over his enemies, these abilities, these skills, this knowledge, this acuity, this resonance in the lives of other people. All these things that you have and more, I would have given you more if you'd only continued to trust me. But no, I wasn't enough for you. You began to try to say that God wasn't enough. I want to find it on myself, on my own. There's the autonomous self, the, the heart what, 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 uh, what wants what it wants. You see, the heart wants what it wants. So the idea that we allow that false narrative because we begin to deceive ourselves into thinking that God's the enemy of our, of our joy. And that's the fundamental basis of temptation is to believe that what God commands you to do is not as good as what you think you, could, you should do. So uh, the, that discrepancy, I won't go any further into this, but the, there's a whole psychology that this illustrates 
And people, human char character, human nature hasn't changed in, in, in these thousands of years, it hasn't changed. Circumstances change, but our character, so we all are vulnerable. And if you don't have a copy of, of, of Conform to His Image, I would invite you to get that. If you do have a copy, read the Warfare Spirituality uh, facet, Warfare Spirituality, the warfare with the, with the flesh, the world, and the devil and then the weapons of our warfare. I would invite you to consider that seriously because you're in a war, whether you like it or not. And the it's it's only issue is going to be how you're waging the warfare. And the more serious you get about your faith, the more uh, opposition there will be to your growth by the enemy. But the more you're invited, though, to intimacy with Christ so that he becomes your source of strength and power. David forgot who he was. He forgot where he came from. He forgot where he was going. And when a man forgets his name, his identity, he loses everything. He's a cipher. So he said, send me the Uriah the Hittite. So the woman can, well, we we'll go further though. And so he saw the woman. Um, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, uh, Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now, Uriah the Hittite was one of David's 30 mighty men. It's very important for you to know that. He sent messengers and took her. I think this was not an event. It was a process. Because one thing leads to the next. You couldn't, you couldn't do too much. You couldn't go from here to here. Gradual increment. And so he came to him. He lay, he lay with her. When she had purified himself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. The woman conceived. She sent and told David, I'm pregnant. David sent to Joab, his, uh, his uh, general, saying, send me Uriah the Hittite, her husband. So he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, he said, go down to your house, wash your feet. I'm going to be uh, taking care of you. Um, so get, I'm going to take you out of the war for a while. And Uriah slept at the door of the king's house instead of doing, because he said it was not honorable to do this. And so David wanted him to do this so that he'd have an excuse. And so um, he says, the ark and the temp Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters. My lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. Here he has to virtually rebuke the king because the king is doing just that. Um, so he wants to, him, he's trying to seduce him and, to, and convince him to stay there and let loose of his convictions, but he wouldn't do so. And so he didn't go down to his house. So he wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. So Uriah was given a letter. It's his own death sentence. Kill this man because I can't get him out of my hair. And so place Uriah in the front line of the fiercest battle and withdraw from him so that he may be struck down and die. So it was as Job kept on his watch in the city that he put him in a place where he knew there were valiant men. And so what happened was Uriah the Hittite would die and died in that context. I won't go into more of the details, but the net, the net of the matter is that when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. When the time of mourning was over, he sent and brought her to his house and she became his wife. Then she bore him a son. Notice the last sentence. But the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. We knew it, but it's an important summary statement, you see. So we ask ourselves again, how is it possible for a man to go from here to there and then from there to there? I tell you, it's never, it's never a blowout. It's always a slow leak. Always. So that, therefore... It doesn't, it, even if you, if you catch yourself and realize I'm being inconsistent, now is the time to return. Because instead of beating yourself up while you still have enough of a will, because what happens is through these foolish decisions, the more you make, the more anemic your will becomes. You see, that's why I say um, most men have not only slo sloppy thought lives, but what do they have with their will? Flabby wills. Because after a while, the more you succumb to disobedience, the weak, lesser your resolve becomes. So you have a diminished capacity to say no to sin and yes to God, you see. You have a diminished perception, acuity, and as a consequence, you become more vulnerable. We hear about the frog in the kettle. The, the error with the frog in the kettle is if you were to tell them, hey, you're in a kettle you're, and it's, the water's about to boil, um, then we have the illusion that maybe if he understands that he'll, fl fl he'll go out. No. 
usually by the time he finds out it's too late because he's been enervated by the, by the, by the heat of the water. And even if he knows he's in a, in a kettle, he can't, doesn't have the energy to jump out. He doesn't have the capacity to do that. So he's diminished his true identity. He doesn't have the dignity that he was meant to have. He doesn't have the, uh, the true security he was meant to have. He doesn't have the true significance he was meant to have. And of course, the next chapter, we'll talk about the, the consequences and the rebuke of David. But the point that I'm suggesting here as I go back to this is then, remember, you want to be brutally honest about your thought life. And if you do not have a man in your, friend, in your, in your life that you can call, to, you need to think about, is there someone I can trust with my deepest and darkest temptations? Because all of us have a flesh signature. We know we've talked about this before. Um, and so if there's an area that's secret that you're practicing that no one else knows about, it has a power over you. And until you name that demon to another person, it'll have power. But when you name it for what it is, it loses its power, especially when you invite another to ask you how you're doing in that area. Because accountability must be invited. It's not to be imposed. When you invite a man to give you, you're not only telling him, I want you to ask me how I'm doing in this area on a consistent basis. We have, the reason why that's more effective for accountability is we have more fear of men than we do of God. We care more about what men think than we do about what God thinks. So God mediates that knowing that. He mediates that through people and mediates our need through people. But ultimately, though, it's not the man. It's God himself to, which we are, who, to whom we are going to give an account. That's why I say you've got to live as if tonight could be the night of your, where you stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Don't suppose you're going to live all day, all this whole day. Don't suppose, let alone that you have a year to live. That's, that's, that's uh, nutty to think that you have a fixed year to live, but five years. So again, you have to realize every day must be lived because you're going to give an account. And that will, that's sooner than we think. So live, so live as to um, walk before him and walk with integrity before him and ask the spirit to show us if there's any area of unconfessed sin and acknowledge it to the Lord and thank him for his forgiveness. But because if, if we don't, it'll have a power over you that'll diminish your true humanity, your true digni dignity. And that will then be a sad diminishment to the point where you've basically you've become a benched Christian. I think if, if you're saved by grace, you're saved by grace through faith, yes, but reward in the kingdom of heaven is based on faithfulness and opportunity, and there will be, uh, there will, we will suffer loss. Um, so we want to ask ourselves, I, I've often said this, write your obituary now and, and ask whether it would play well in heaven. What do you bring under your hand to the ultimate show and tell? I like that. A friend of mine asked that question. What do you bring in your hand? What are you bringing to show? Uh, so you're having to ask, am I, who am I going to give an account to? And whose opinion do I fear the most? Because the fear of man brings a snare, but the fear of God is life and peace. Uh, th th thoughts or questions? Hey, Dave, do you think that, you know, uh, the midlife crisis maybe has been pushed another decade or longer? I, I think that. Th yeah, I think you're, prob you're probably right, because as, as I think about this, um, uh, I think it's, a, it's, it's an amazing phenomen phenomenon. This is an example. It, 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 hikikimori are generally defined as adults who hold up in their parents' and other relatives' homes for the six months or more. This is in Japan, often confined to a single room. They do not work and rarely engage with the outside world, and in many cases, filling their days with television, the internet, and video games. They cannot sustain meaningful relationships, often not even with the parents who physically and financially care for them. Some have lived in the state for years, even decades. That's depressing. You know, you don't, there are a lot of hikikomoris in this country right now, and it's put it off, as Archie is saying. We've, we've literally, we, we now have created a thing that never existed before, namely adolescence. That never existed in human history until the 20th century. There was no such thing as adolescence. You have to bear that in mind. Uh, retirement wasn't really regarded in the same way as we now regard it as well. But the point is, we are now 
having adult adolescence and adolescence is going now into the 30s, now into the 40s, starting to push to the 40s. And, and, and so there's a diminishment and there's a loneliness, there's a darkness, there's a diminishment being multiplied and amplified by AI in ways that have never been even possibly before where people can live in a digital world. And so as a consequence, I do think that they can postpone it in a world of fantasy and illusion. But at the end of the day, whether you like it or not, you're an analog being. You're in a physical body. And the reality is this body is wearing out and you only have a few years left. And if you want to suppose that your games will work and that, that your, your artificial reality, it's not going to sustain you. It's a, it's a, a castle in the, in the, in, in, of your own imagination. It's a difficult world and none, we've never seen things like what we see now. I don't wring my hands in despair, remember though. I actually, though, walk in hope, I walk in peace, and I walk in joy uh, because I choose that to be the way in, of, of vitality in life, and that to me is critical. I'll stop with this one last thought here um, on my perspective because um, it, it's, it makes a big, big difference, my perspective. Um, instead of ring, as I wrote it to someone before, instead of wringing our hands in despair and cursing the darkness, how can we be living signs and agents of the kingdom of God who are defined by the living word rather than the dying world? A community of people who live in the, in, from the inside out and who choose the way of gratitude and contentment as they soar on the thermals of the spirit to stay in the eye of the storm. Remember those metaphors? The, the, the aerodynamics of the spirit of God lifts you up above, above the gravity of the world, flesh, and devil, and, you, and you're in the hurricane. The hurricane force is ramped up radically. This is a higher number that you can attribute to, and that's a logarithmic scale. It's going up fast. And the fact is, there's still an eye. It's still a place of, pe of peace, of joy, of contentment, knowing that God is on the throne. He raises up kings, deposes them. He is in the throne of history. And ultimately, he is preparing the world as he's promised uh, before the coming of the Lord. He's getting it ready. And he's, he told, told us, in the days before my, uh, my coming, it'll be like this. And so I go on to say, um, my creative... Uh, I des my desire is to inspire people to embed their stories in a longer, larger, and more arrested narrative. Here's, I'm increasingly interested in the pursuit of a story-driven amplification of imagination that will winsomely compel people to long for more. And that's one of the things I'm doing with uh, using beauty now, a museum of beauty, that sort of a thing, because that's very, very critical. Um, I could send that to you, yeah, because that's a very important concept here. And the last thing, please go to the Kenbo.org website because there um, on the home page, um, we have um, some spaces here uh, for the, uh, this Behold Your King. God knows we need security, hope, and rest. The world doesn't have them. And so this, is, this gives you details about- At the Cove. At the Cove. Mm -hmm. May 13th through the 15th. Yeah.